So let me begin with a potentially provocative statement. The Chinese are positioning themselves to lead the future of education abroad, not the US. Perhaps it is no coincidence that this development is paralleled by an extraordinary increase in Chinese foreign investment of over $180 billion during the last decade and a surge in Chinese students studying, particularly in the United States, although elsewhere also. US higher education is, is, uh, is stuck in past assumptions and internal professional disputes distant from public demand and future opportunity. And despite cosmetic tweaks to traditional programmatic paradigms, what is potentially the future of education abroad eludes us. US higher education professionals these days find themselves in the shoes of American corporate leaders, but unlike them, they are, I suggest, not adjusting to new circumstances. Fred Kearns in Bloomberg Business Week commentary describes the CEO's evolving position by referring to results of a recent survey of corporate leaders conducted by IBM's Institute for Business Values. I quote, much has happened in the past two years to shake the historical assumption held by the women and men who are in charge. In addition to global recession, the century's first decade heightened awareness of the issues surrounding global climate change and the interplay between natural events, our supply chains for materials, food, and even talent. In short, CEOs have experienced the realities of global integration. The world is necessarily interconnected economically, socially, and politically, and operating as a system of systems. So what does this look like, the level of consumer relations? For too many enterprises, the answer is that the customers are increasingly connected, but not to them. Leaders in US higher education are not accommodating a contemporary student population that is both interconnected globally, that is to each other via technology, and most importantly, not connected to them. US students increasingly are trying to navigate around officially offered education abroad programs to get what they want and arguably need for the world they face in the future. They mirror the entrepreneurial spirit of their millennial generation and maneuver for bespoke programs that they believe will fulfill their needs rather than accept the off-the-shelf, top-down programs proffered by US higher education. Now, we're getting into some of the juicy stuff here, if you happen to notice. <laughs> the IBM survey indicates that CEOs are grasping the troubling situation facing them. And against this backdrop of interconnection, interdependency, and complexity, are declaring that success in global business now requires fast thinking, and continuous innovation at all levels of an organization. Through creativity, they will reinvent their customer relationships and achieve greater operational dexterity. The question before us is what US education abroad professionals, you, will do in the face of this global change. Will you insist on what it's always been just because it always was or will you embrace change and lead? I suggest that without embracing change, education abroad professionals will, full, will forego a critical opportunity to reshape education abroad. But also, you will relinquish participation in broader efforts to change the future of US higher education. And therein, therein, this interconnectivity within higher ed is your salvation against marginalization. Again, and I emphasize this further, without this significant retooling, this again is the risk of marginalization and the subject of being hopelessly connected to external pressures by faculty, administrators, and those who would reduce the cost of higher education through the elimination of what are falsely considered superfluous programs. Education abroad is arguably, just like the arts, an easy target because it remains foolishly, in some people's mind, as a luxury, a luxury in a financially stressed higher education system. 
despite decades of compelling arguments to the contrary. And again, in the same spirit, I am one of those. I was a participant my junior year in IES in Freiburg, right out of that tradition. Several months ago, I had a dinner conversation with a young Chinese man who came to the United States for study at a top-tier liberal arts college, proceeded to a law degree at Harvard, and is now an associate for a white shoe New York City law firm. Now, I had not a lot of insight into what it meant to be a, a white shoe associate. But let me give you a little context. We came to dinner. Dinner started at 8. He put down his phone, his iPhone, and he said, excuse me, I, I apologize for this during dinner, but I need to keep this phone here. We have a system for the associates. When I go out of the office for anything, the system, the iPhone, has a screen that goes green, yellow, red. If it's green, I can continue where I am. If it goes yellow, something's happening, and I better get ready to go back to the office. If it's red, I have to leave. Uh, it went red at 11 o'clock. He had to go back to the office. Quite a world. Now, I wanted to meet with him to find out what might be behind the recent rise in Chinese students seeking study in the United States. I was curious. And I asked a whole lot of people over the year about the same thing. But I want to talk to him, and you'll see why. Of course, according to the Institute for International Education, the Open Doors 2013 report, there is a 21% overall increase of Chinese students studying the US over the last year, 26% of these at the undergraduate level. There has been an annual expansion rate of approximately the same percentage for the last three years. Chinese students studying the US, both undergraduate and graduate, now represent a third of all international students, almost 235,000 out of approximately 820,000 students, the largest single concentration of international students ever studying here in the United States. Is this study in the United States just an interesting novel experience for these students? Or is there a bigger concept in play? I knew that this young man would have particular insight since as a high school student in China, he founded and managed the most significant website for Chinese students seeking undergraduate study in the United States, cuus.org or cuus.cn, as it is known in China. He remains involved with this website and monitors evolving thought about undergraduate international study in the United States by thousands of Chinese students. He began our conversation by stating that in China there are three factors in the last decade that greatly influence undergraduate education abroad and that these factors are linked to a projection of what the Chinese desire from education abroad in the future. Not all aspects of this ambition are yet realized, but work is in progress. Like other aspects of their political, cultural, economic, and educational development in recent decades, the Chinese intend to supersede education abroad as currently practiced in the United States because they do not judge it to be the best model for global competitive success through international education, a statement directly from him. Now, the three factors involve schools, students, and parents. Let's start with schools. About 10 years ago, top high, high, schools, uh, top high schools in China had a special track to prepare its students for the two most outstanding universities within the country. In the last five years, this has changed radically. There is still a special track, but it now prepares students principally for US universities, and to a lesser extent, yet still to a significant extent, the UK Australian and Canadian institutions. This special track, needless to say, demands rigorous academics, but that is not all. The Chinese are attuned to the admission requirements of US universities and now offer opportunities for extracurricular activities and recognition for leadership in such engagement. It's perhaps important to know that this young man also said, with that recognition, comes to match our scandals at admissions, uh, questionable practice there. Parents, for example, will pay local and regional newspapers to write stories about the 
leadership accomplishments of their children. Get those in the papers, true or not true, and then send those to US universities. I naturally asked my dinner companion about why the focus was now so exclusively on education abroad at US colleges and universities. And the answer was not what I expected. The explanation lies within the aspirations of the contemporary Chinese student. Students. As of 10 years ago, Chinese students seeking a US undergraduate education were motivated solely by high academic ambitions. You know many of these students. They appreciated that knowledge, particularly in mathematics, the sciences, and engineering, was best obtained in the United States and not, they judged, in China. It was imperative that they study in the United States if they were to achieve excellence in their chosen field. The US institutions that best provided this up-to-date knowledge to the highest standards were the countries, our country's leading research universities. The reputation of a particular university was critical to them, and they took great pride in being associated with this institution, but only so far as you'll see in a second. And they fulfilled a stereotype of the Chinese students studying in America. Their courses of study were restricted, as I said, to mathematics, the sciences, and engineering. Their objective after obtaining a prestigious US degree was to continue at a top graduate school in the United States and then get a job here. They did not see going back to China as a highly desirable professional or life option. However, beginning about five years ago, there was a radical change in the type and ambition of Chinese students desiring undergraduate study in the United States. Approximately 90% of the Chinese students now studying, now coming to America, reflect this change. They desire a good academic education, one that is reputable, but not necessarily the most elite. This attitude makes a far greater number of US colleges and universities acceptable to Chinese students. They desire an academic program that stresses what they believe to be the strength of US higher education, and thus, the American mind at its best. Interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. These are the academic equivalent to the ability to perceive connection, similarity, and even the creative element in what at first seemed disparate pieces. Unlike the previous generation, these Chinese students are open to taking courses and even majoring in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Of course, US students are presently being advised to move away from these disciplines into more practical subjects thought to yield a job upon graduation. The supreme irony, of course. The allegiance of the new Chinese students is not to a particular college, university, or academic program. Woe to development officers in the future but rather to a romanticized, and I state this, romanticized view of the US college or university as the best platform upon which to achieve a transportable global lifestyle. They believe the US university culture is transcendentally global and that it celebrates movement, momentum, entrepreneurialism, invention, and risk taking. They believe it preaches opportunity and provides examples of how to fund, distribute, and market ideas widely. They believe this despite the opinion of commentators such as Bill Keller in a recent New York Times op-ed piece. Keller warns that these attributes commonly associated with US education, under threat due to decreased funding for research, a failing pre-collegiate education system, and immigration laws that deny the United States talent. For these new globalists, the young people I'm talking about here, the stirring within China, the words of John Steinbeck in Travels with Charlie in Search of America still ring true, and I quote, I saw in their eyes something I was to see over and over in every part of the nation a burning desire to go, to move, to get underway, any place, away from any here. I saw this look 
and heard this yearning everywhere in every state I visited. <clears throat> Nearly every American hungers to move. And this is the disposition, the state of mind sought in the new globalism. Chinese students see their future selves through education abroad in the United States, and they like what they see. They want to absorb how America works. They are integrating the academic and non-academic sectors of US undergraduate education into a seamless whole by virtue of an ambition that transcends the college experience. The desire for a place in an engaging, exciting global lifestyle that the US undergraduate experience is expected to provide. They wish to be part of a larger narrative that drives them to accomplishment. Undergraduate study in the US is seen as a necessary means to a material end. Interestingly, they confide somewhat disbelievingly that their fellow US students are not taking advantage of these opportunities, either through lack of preparation or lack of interest and motivation. Rather, they, these young people, the new globalists, pursue learning with intentionality. And many American students, according to them, seem aimless and unmotivated. Chinese students consider of critical importance the integration of US college life with American cultural and social icons. They want to experience now the full range of life in the United States. Yes. Visits to Walmart, McDonald's, Starbucks, Whole Foods, athletic events, museums, classical and contemporary concerts, entrepreneurial clubs, cooking, dancing, outing clubs, civic festivals, parades, even bowling parties, all of them are important to them. They believe that this insight and practice into the way young Americans develop outside the classroom are keys to a life of adventure, entrepreneurialism, and risk taking, personal agency, technological design innovation, and wealth. These are all deemed attributes necessary for living a sophisticated global lifestyle in the innovation society. And that's what they want, the innovation society. And this is achieved through interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity on US campuses and through community outreach. Unlike the Chinese students before them, this lifestyle will not unfold exclusively in America. Their aspiration later in life with all this experience of the US undergraduate, we're just a platform. We're a pass through for what they seek. Their lives will unfold in Paris, London, Buenos Aires, Berlin, Singapore, Tokyo, Sydney, Johannesburg, Rome, Madrid, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, New York, or Los Angeles with frequent movement among these destinations. Except for the global attraction of New York and Los Angeles, the new globalists tend to leave America upon graduating. The language of new globalism is English. Oh, this might not be standard US or British English, but a globally exercised English created by contingency, such as creative misunderstanding and misuse. Of course, each non-native English-speaking student possesses at least a second language from their place of origin, a global skill unfortunately not possessed by most US students and therefore an obstacle to our students' full participation in this new globalism. While the new globalists lead with English as they live and work throughout the world, they have other options for communication once circumstances warrant. They are linguistically resourceful and depend on this attribute for global advantage and flexibility. They depend upon it for movement, unimpeded movement. In the case of Chinese students, they work diligently to improve their English competence while in the US, and is, and is the ticket to the global lifestyle they seek. Now, I know what you're thinking. Many of you might think I'm creating an illusionary picture here. The Chinese students you encounter often seem to remain among themselves and speak Chinese frequently. They seem to self-consciously isolate themselves. I agree that this scenario seems to be the case, but as often in life, appearances are deceiving. 
I equate the Chinese student situation to the simultaneous influx to college and universities in the US of first generation students and those from American based socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds with wide achievement gaps who through no fault of their own do not readily fit into the middle class dominated US campuses. Both groups are bewildered at first, keep a low profile to gain orientation and confidence and often are absent appropriate programs on campus to orient them to expectations. I'm talking about here, the first generation and students with achievement gaps. I, as you heard, was one of those first generation students. When I was growing up, my mother worked in the home and my father was, worked on a wooden box assembly line and was a cook. I kept such a low profile during my time at Dickinson as an undergraduate, despite my burning desire to figure out how things worked on a college campus and get involved, that when I was elected or appointed president of my own college, my classmates wondered if I actually was in their class. <laughs> this is true, because I had to keep low. I had to watch. I had to figure it out. Well, guess what? I figured it out, all right? The Chinese students now are taking English seriously, although it might not look that way, as a ticket to advancement and are at once gradually and cautiously trying to gain experience. But neither they nor we at colleges and universities have found a way yet to appreciate their introverted style and develop it in the essentially extroverted middle class culture that is higher education in America. And yes, university and college education is extroverted. You have to be out there. You're judged for not being out there. You're judged for not contributing information to accountability. You got to give it up to be judged and to be ranked. In fact, many admissions officers seem to believe, and I think you relate to this, that the financial woes of American colleges and universities can be solved readily by just accepting Chinese full pay students without acknowledging the support they need to achieve their aspirations on an American campus. The same can be said about first generation students and those who are challenged by inadequate preparation, whatever the cause. Great similarity. Again, connections. You have connections to other parts of the big puzzle of American higher ed. The modes of communication of the new globalism are the internet, and social media. The sphere of ideas and actions operates beyond a specific nation or culture, with most time spent far removed from what previous generations would deem a distinctive local culture. In fact, this new globalism, and this is significant, I think, this new globalism generally dismisses any claim that there remain significant differences across cultures today and thus applaud, recognize and applaud a prevailing sameness of life across the globe as defined by mass consumerism, common technologies, and shared aspirational and financial values. Transculturalism is the watchword. Perhaps the notion approaches the words of the narrator in J.G. Farrell's Assis Krishnapur, and this is it. Civilization must be more than fashions and customs. It must be a superior view of humankind. Now, again, critically important. The new globalism, the new education abroad is about seeking sameness, not seeking difference. And I would claim, because I went through it too, many of you did, that has been our posture in study abroad in America for decades. Go out there, find the differences, come back. The first lady in her speech in China recently said exactly that. Go overseas and find difference. Go overseas and find similarity, a different approach. We'll get into that in a second. Well, this new globalism might sound superficial. There is a compelling desire by these students to be exposed during their undergraduate education to critical global challenges that they believe are shared by all people regardless of nationality or cultural origin. Among these challenges are sustainability, peace, 
politics, ecology, uh, consumerism, health, technology, personal relationships, imagination and creativity, community building, immigration, global ethics, when possible, human rights, social change, wealth distribution, poverty, and entrepreneurialism. Big issues that we all are challenged by and share. And whereas study abroad professionals worry about US students overseas having contact with locals, students of the new globalism are way ahead of them. They freely build shared alliances via the internet and through issue-targeted face-to-face meetings all over the world. In fact, the very nature of powerfully shared global concerns simply reinforces students' belief in the sameness of the world. Study abroad is about commonality, not difference. And unfortunately, again, traditional study abroad in the US is based upon exposing students to cultural difference, not commonality. The new globalism is the product of the multicultural imperative that has been with us for several decades, morphing into a new post-nationalist, hyper-globalizing chapter of our history. I have no idea what I just said there, but it is, it is interesting. And I like the word hyphen, I mean that hyper, hyper everything. Oh, I love it, okay. This is an observation that Professor Eric Sundquist of Johns Hopkins applied to recent developments in the humanities in his essay, The Humanities and the National Interest. In this context, it is not surprising that the Chinese students are now interested in taking humanities courses. They view them as a vital path to powerful perspectives on the best of the human spirit, both historically and in the modern world. And they relate them to material accomplishment. They relate them to intentionality. They encompass this Benjamin Rush idea, which we, American education, never had the revolution. We still love the royals. We still love education for education's sake. We've never gotten it that this country was supposed to have a useful education, a useful education in the liberal arts, applied to participating, building, preserving a democracy. Cultures approach globally shared challenges the way they do because of their distinctive histories. Chinese students also take humanities and the arts to gain transcultural empathy, an important ingredient in confirming and maintaining culture, cultural homogeneity. According to Professor Sunquist, the humanities are our principal vehicle for engendering sympathy, the ability to imagine the experience of another, to see ourselves from that perspective, to make another's life our own, if only for a moment. Now, the new globalists want an education abroad experience to be highly pragmatic. They want to do something during their international study that provides them with additional knowledge and practice in what they believe to be the, quote, American edge. And they want to engage actively in areas of shared global interests that are already available on campus or in the surrounding community. Numerous Chinese students approached me at Dickinson and wanted to start entrepreneurial and innovation clubs. They wanted to be exposed to the big ideas of intellectual history, especially as they pertain to the United States and apply them to campus life. They want experience at being leaders in the US undergraduate setting. It's frustrating. They're not quite sure how to break in. My conversations were private. They weren't broad. They weren't exposed. They didn't take to the public forum. They want practice in what they believe to be the fundamentals of a global lifestyle that permeate all areas of their college experience. This pervasive engagement advances, they believe, their understanding about how to approach shared global issues and prepares them pragmatically to enter an engaged global lifestyle after graduation. Again, there is clearly a material intentionality possessed by the new globalists. They wish to acquire something that can be personally lived and be professionally beneficial as a result of their study and activity at a US college or university. The new globalists are also beginning to exercise their own interpretations of what they perceive the global lifestyle in America to offer. For example, they are increasingly embracing self-determination and personal agency two related dispositions that they believe inform American entrepreneurialism and innovation. 
by Offend, and this is straight from number of Chinese, including this uh, young man, beginning to doubt and reject the assistance of recruiting agents. They distrust recruiting agents for a variety of reasons and go independently, increasingly, to the U.S. to take third-level uh, take third-level summer courses, to determine where they eventually wish to study. Again, this is just growing, just starting. They use social media to share among other applicants and those already at U.S. colleges and universities authentic advice and counsel. They realize that most U.S. students do not use agents, so they, turn, so they in turn will not use them. Again, they're trying to mirror this behavior. Parents probably wonder what happened to them. Here they are. The parents of the first large wave of Chinese students to study in America had, uh, the, 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 had uh, they, the, these parents were government officials, usually. The most recent influx comes from parents who are wealthy entrepreneurs and business leaders. They represent new wealth that connects financially, financially and culturally to the world beyond China. Their wealth translates into an obligation to their children. They would bring shame upon themselves if they did not provide them with the best education that money can buy, an education that relates to their ambitions, of their own ambitions, of a globally engaged, transportable lifestyle for generations now to come. For these parents, an undergraduate education abroad represents the indispensable platform for such ambitions. Now, the new globalism that I outline exists and is increasingly practiced by a significant proportion of the student population of the world in different degrees and different shades. Most definitely, we see the Chinese, but in varying degrees, the Germans, Japanese, French, Spanish, Brazilians, even English. The new global students, for new global students, the whole is greater than the parts. Education abroad, the acquisition of a foreign language, participation in campus clubs, all this is directed to achieving what is most personally desired, a global lifestyle. Now, there are three historical paradigms for education abroad, um, and these we need to deal with. Because in these three paradigms, we find that we have work to do. The first is intercultural paradigms. The second is academic disciplines. And the third is language and cultural learning. Let me treat these very quickly. In fact, by the way, these three are increasingly without application as the field of study abroad fractures into competing winner-take-all schools of thought. I regret this deeply. You'll see why. And I'm talking about you here. We see true believers and their followers with a vocabulary for each school, each school of thought in your profession that approaches in density and in, in invention that of the humanities when it embraced structuralism, semiotics, and deconstruction several decades ago. The result for the humanities was devastating. It alienated itself from the general public, created a closed circle of communication of like-minded professionals talking to each other in a jargon that only they could understand. I regret this, obviously, as my field is um, the humanities. And I was at Johns Hopkins when we were assaulted by structuralism, semiotics, it was in the change. I was there when Paul de Man, Girard, all these folks were brought. Excellent provocation, embraced, however, as true believers. And whenever you get into either ors, you're in trouble. What happened to the humanities? The public lost interest and support for them. And it was impossible, eventually, because they lost sight of others for the professionals to defend themselves against the public, because they were in their own worlds. And I would suggest that you're doing the same thing. You are creating schools of thought in this room. You're creating jargon. You're doing it again. You are beginning to have more interest in your schools of thought than you are in the business of education abroad. 
If you accept my argument, how are study abroad professionals and others in higher education proceed? Resolution is important because you do not work in isolation and are bombarded by demands from, or from administrators, faculty, and students for all sorts of programs, whether, whether worthy or not. Often, those are established overseas. Of course, we can judge the new globalism that I describe as inappropriate, shallow, the playground of the spoiled and wealthy, who miss the point of study abroad. For me personally, it is a sad day when the world is judged without variety and disparate voices, beliefs and practices. But perhaps, and maybe I have to look this in the face, perhaps I am just of another generation and the world I knew no longer exists. Perhaps what I thought was different is now trivial and the difference is found rather today in approaches to shared challenges. Difference is commonality. Perhaps the globalism or better internationalism I grew up with morphed into something else that is still a globalism that works for the coming generations. It is a critical pursuit for the world they face. That is always a possibility that I have outgrown myself and should not be dismissed by yours truly. And if this is indeed the case, what currently guys study abroad in the United States must be rethought radically. And that is what I believe this conference is all about. Now again, let me take these three historic paradigms in a little more depth. Intercultural paradigms. A significant movement within education abroad theory is interculturally motivated. It is an interventionalist position that posits difference in the world determined culturally and accessed by immersion of students into another environment to enlarge their more provincial perspectives. The new globalists challenge the interventionalist position and call it passe or non-performative. For them, the world is the same, as I said, and much that is considered different is in fact trivial. Yes, it is idiosyncratic, but not globally profound. Let me take Germany, my area of concentration. Now, I'm just going to mention a few, a few uh, differences. First, we all know that there's a stereotype of Germans being uh, quite uh, affectionate for order and punctuality. <laughs> we also know that there is a cultural difference in, uh, in their fear, their morbid fear of any breeze within a contained space. The word is, the words are estit, and that means even if it's 180 degrees, if that window is open and there's a breeze, you are going to die. <laughs> you will die. And if you are in a car, as I have been, Bill and others, all of you who've done a lot of this travel, and it's 180 degrees out, and there's no AC in the car, which usually isn't, well, that's changing. You put all the windows up, and you turn on the fan and bring in that hot air, and it keeps circulating, and you're dying in there. Then lastly, another cultural difference, a favorite of all of you, I'm sure. Nakedness. Nakedness. <laughs> yes, the Germans love nakedness. Yes. The New York Times this past Sunday in the magazine confirmed the German love of nakedness, except when you're inside a building in a pool with others, you keep your bathing suit on. Anywhere else, let it rip, let it rip, literally let it rip, all right? Now, these are, of course, cultural differences. We know that. But the new globalists deem these differences essentially trivial. Interesting, but trivial. And I think we in study abroad over decades have been on the search for trying to understand these differences as a way into the culture. They are interested rather in the habits of mind and action of contemporary Germans that distinctively influence their responses to shared global challenges. This they believe is meaningful difference that deserves their attention and will only get their attention. 
There is, for example, the Germans' penchant for saving and fiscal restraint as influences global finance. The Germans' long-standing habits of conserving energy, engaging sustainability, and creating new forms of energy through wind and solar power that influence global environmental policy and practice. Evolving German programs to deal with immigration and health care, and the Germans' relationship of management to labor, as well as the tradition of solid craftsmanship and reliability in design and manufacturing. All these are arguably somewhat distinctive approaches to shared global challenges. They issue from a specific nation and its people and have been formed over centuries of thought and activity peculiar, arguably, to these people. The distinctive contribution to the globally shared challenge is the concrete motivation for a new globalist to study the culture, language, history, literature, art, music, and science of this particular people in more depth. The new globalists, however, usually receive their initial information about these distinctions through the English language. Again, it is how they are, another nation is as worthy as its contribution, its distinctive contribution to a shared global issue to be engaged. The proposition that US students can truly absorb, and that's going to get dicey again, the proposition that US students can truly absorb cultural nuance of another nation and its peoples through English, however, is disingenuous. Through English, you can capture a degree of instrumentality and functionality. You can understand what another culture is doing and in turn act upon that at the global solution level. This is the claim of the new globalists and their virtue. They know their limits. They know how far they can go. And it's operational. But the intricate web of emotive, psychological, and historical reasons for cultural distinction, creativity, and dysfunction remain elusive and not entirely replicable, being ability to be replicated, as long as the language out of which the culture was defined is absent. The delivery of critical data to explain comprehensively another people's understanding of a demanding situation and their response to it are inaccessible to the linguistically bereft American student. Let's be candid. Contact with truly transformative experiences, those that may be emotionally and psychologically upsetting, causing deep change through an international experience. These sorts of things for an American student are likely these days to be prohibited by legal safeguards appropriately imposed upon US study abroad programs. We could never purposely expose our students to political upheaval, violence, injustice, cruelty among peoples, death, poverty, aging, or sickness in the name of educational experience. We can't get that close. Not possible. Now, academic disciplines. Education abroad in the post-World War II era was shaped and controlled by the academic sector of undergraduate education. Often a professor who had informal connections with an international colleague created a study abroad initiative in their shared discipline. Many third-party study abroad organizations are defined by the academic sector. Of course, it makes sense. That's what a university and college is all about, academics. What is odd, however, is that when students describe how they benefited from education abroad, the benefits lie outside of academics. Students speak of emotional and social growth to a certain degree, and a greater ability to deal with the unknown. Academic program progress is seldom mentioned. And if the students studied in a non-English speaking country, there are few attempts at pre and post assessment to determine if the time abroad advanced foreign language learning. In many cases, there is no attempt to learn the host country language. There is also little effort to pursue research that might clarify whether the self-proclaimed results of personal emotional growth and the ability to deal with difference could not have been accomplished by study in a different environment in the United States, although applaud the forum for taking this on. If, however, the benefits of education abroad that students cite are accurate, then the traditionally defined model of study abroad in the United States proves inadequate to reward accomplishment. Personal and emotional growth is not the subject of academic coursework and receives no formal recognition in American higher education. Because of a long-standing antagonism in US higher education between the academics 
and those who support the out-of-class activity of students on campus because of this antagonism, there is no way to give credit towards a degree for personal advancement. And you all know this. The academics thinks, think the uh, student life people are shallow and insubstantial. And student life people think the academics are horses patooey. <laughs> all right. Now, the students in this are adrift. They might obtain a valuable set of life skills through education abroad, but their college or university bestows no formal recognition for this accomplishment as it does for academic coursework. While awarding academic credit may be inappropriate for the acquisition of life skills and personal growth, there needs to be some other form of public recognition. There are numerous programs that expose US students to the shared challenges that define the new globalism. Often these initiatives include inter uh, international uh, study before or after an on-campus portion of a class, and the foreign travel portion is directly related to the subject of instruction. Many of these courses are designated service learning, and they connect an existing academic course to volunteerism, community service, field research, or pre-professional internships. While such efforts are highly laudable, in my opinion, they lack critical components to define the new globalism, to match the new globalism. For the student, the objective of the initiative and the source of motivation is the academic credit awarded for the class. There is nothing motivating them beyond that academic objective, and there is no recognition again for non-academic knowledge and skill acquisition. Unlike the new globalism, based on the intentionality of students to acquire a global lifestyle, something large, something that transcends the academic experience itself, US study abroad exhibits an instrumentality that ends for the student at the conclusion of class. There is little to no reinforcement for what has been learned, no continuing connection to other coursework or out-of-class experiences, and no recognition of social and personal growth on the transcript. Now, there is this person called Dr. Rush, Benjamin Rush, and you heard about him. He was actually an early and prominent advocate of study abroad. He probably was the first in your field the first to advise a young person going abroad in written form. He anticipated the importance of education abroad, of out-of-class exploration, right from the beginning in this country. It was not so much academics, that was taken for granted. It was the out-of-class experiences, the bigger picture that was applauded even by Benjamin Rush. And he founded three colleges in this country. In 1780, Rush responded to a letter from John Fulcom, who would eventually become a prominent physician and a member of the American Philosophical Society. This young man was seeking advice about how to approach his study abroad in Edinburgh. Rush drafted an 18-point guide. Again, the first one, 18-point guide. Strikingly, all the points relate to out-of-class engagement, all of them. And this young man was seeking, you know, it was a little different then, he was seeking a medical degree but he was young. It suffices to mention a few of them to indicate this conviction that the out-of-class explorations influence decisively a student's maturation and contribute important perspectives to study as well as later professional development. Again, the intentionality is embedded in the out-of-class suggestion. Here are just a, a few of them. Keep a diary and insert in it the names of the persons you associate with every day, their professions, rank, and character, together with all remarkable anecdotes, facts, and even opinions that fall from them in conversation. Attend shows of all kinds and describe in your journal the most trifling of them. Endeavor to get lodgings in reputable families and make yourself intimate with them. Visit every kind of manufactory and describe them accurately in a book made for that purpose. Find out the price of each article at its delivery from the place of its manufactory. Spend an hour every day for three months in receiving lessons from some principal dancing master. I love this. This goes right to the heart of it. This is living and talking on the diagonal. Now this is in 17, whatever it was, 90, 80, I don't know, who cares. All right. Converse, converse freely with quacks of every class and sex, such as Dennis. <laughs> corn cutters and cancer doctors. <laughs> but establish correspondence with 
people of learning and virtue in every place you leave. Again, Dr. Rush at the beginning got it right. He was anticipating this new globalism. We, we went off in our own direction. Language and culture learning. I've already spoken about language and culture as a paradigm for education abroad. The three key paradigms are, of course, interrelated. But I think that it's important to comment upon the historic difficulty of convincing Americans to master a language other than English. And it's debatable whether we have mastered that one. <laughs> Many of us are still, again, working on that particular. I, a matter of fact, when I was at Dickinson, some Dickinsonians might know this, I started something called Dr. Grammar. I would email students common grammatical mistakes and give them a, what was a good example, what was a bad example, they had to pick it and then I gave the explanation. When I first did that, it was interesting. A lot of the students would say, how dare you insult us that we don't know English grammar? Well, you know, it, it, uh, we were working together and I'm still learning a little bit of English as you can tell by the speech. Uh, but nevertheless, that proceeds. We all know the usual explanations. English is the world's dominant language and you can get along almost anywhere that counts using that language. The United States is a vast country and you can travel far and wide relying upon English. There simply are not enough opportunities for Americans to practice another language outside of periodic classroom instruction and some foreign travel. Now we have noted that the new globalist student seeks to learn English in addition to having his or her native language and that the use of both or multiple languages critical to the global identity. I think the key for their motivation in acquiring a second language is that it is material need, materially needed to participate in the burgeoning transnational, transcultural lifestyle. They desire to have a specific quality of life. They have concrete motivation. Again, it goes beyond take this course. You need it for graduation. Oh, no. They want something more. They want a global lifestyle. They know the rewards of that. Their culture. Broader culture talks about it. The additional language is a practical tool in their approach to opportunity and challenge. US students, to the contrary, while they have been warned repeatedly about the need to learn another language in order to participate in the future world beyond America, seem not to have been introduced to this transcultural, transnational lifestyle that could motivate them to learn one. Language learning remains a separate subject with motivation being restricted to mastering the language and its culture for its own sake and often is still based in literature. For all but the most dedicated and self-motivated students, the pursuit of a second language to fluency is frustrating, fruitless activity. And frankly, we at American College University, we don't get anywhere near fluency usually at the end of four years. Let's cut out the joke. Motivation is a problem given the difficulties of practicing languages such as German, French, Russian, on and on and on in this country. U.S. students see little beyond the drudgery of learning a second language that they may not use in the future. It is all too abstract and distant for them, all too immaterial. And given the circumstances, what I've just described, it's understandable that they wouldn't get engaged. But notice when I mentioned some of these languages, I left out one particular one, Spanish. Spanish is a language that is now accessible throughout much of the United States. There are numerous Spanish-speaking communities. There are bilingual persons living amidst monolingual persons. There are easily accessible radio and television stations. There are Spanish-speaking countries in relative proximity. Bilingual signage in airports, on planes, trains, and buses is far more prevalent. The United States could solve its linguistic challenge and permit citizens critical access, uh, access to global competition and to this global lifestyle by adopting Spanish as our second language in the United States. As students from kindergarten on, as students from kindergarten on would learn Spanish as well as English. Now I know the arguments against this. America has but one official language and that is English. Baloney. So it shall always be, that's what's said, as it explains our greatness and exceptionality. We are great through our evocations in English. It is unpatriot unpatriotic to dismiss English as our nation's one official language, and on and on so it goes. This argument, of course, is like the claim that Christianity is our nation's official religion. Our founding fathers, again, rejected again and again and again calls for one state religion centuries ago. 
I am of the opinion that founding fathers established a nation that was to be dynamic and open to change in order to provide for its continuing growth and prosperity. If that growth is now diminished by our students not gaining fluency in a language other than English and not gaining opportunity to a global lifestyle that will be the future, then we are doing in what those founding fathers intended. We are limiting linguistically their chance at the next generation. Our students, if Spanish were the second language, they would, uh, they would be gaining access to trans transculturalism and transnationalism. That lies ahead for our nation. When that occurs to other languages, what then occurs to other languages if the schools are concentrating on English and Spanish from the beginning? Now this will be tough, even for my own field of German. These other languages will be studied with intent as when young people seek personal access to a particular culture's perspective on a shared global challenge, and not in the forced superficial nature that they are now approached by students. This will provide the motivation that is now absent in US education for language learning. It captures the imagination of the current generation and helps them to make a difference in the global issues that matter to them. This motivation can be advanced by purposeful study abroad at both high school and the college level. Of course, this will be the motivation for the vast majority of students, but not for all, this new globalism. There are some students, and you know them well, who simply want to study a specific language because of family heritage or for pure love of language. This is excellent, but there are not enough of them. Others will study a language because of a specific academic interest. They are the easy cases, but the vast majority of US students will need to be encouraged to acquire a second language for their own sake and for the sake of the nation. That, in turn, will lead them to participation and accomplishment in a transnational, transcultural lifestyle. So to summarize, what are what is the new globalism that unfolds through education abroad? What am I talking about here? One, the new globalism affirms sameness in the world through transculturalism and transnationalism. Two, difference among peoples is a negative unless that difference reflects a particular culture or nation's approach to shared global challenges. Three, the new globalists want practice during undergraduate years through targeted, customized programs in and out of the classroom in order to identify solutions to shared global challenges. Four, US colleges and universities are the desired platform to gain the knowledge and skills that define the new globalism. Five, education abroad students validate the worthiness of both academic and non-academic programs of a US college as important to gaining the new globalism. In academics, the new globalists want interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. In out-of-class activities, the new globalists want to experience the diversity of US engagement and practice leadership among fellow students. The new globalists speak at least two languages, and English is the shared language for the new globalism. The new globalists will live a life of high mobility and will remain connected principally through social media and the internet. Now, of course, not all students going abroad will be so intentional and pursue so vigorously shared global concerns, exploratory vocational opportunities, and greater ambitions as those I describe. And again, you know these students. They're still there. For these students, study abroad remains essentially a chance to see the world, continue what they know best, albeit in another environment, and yes, party, and spend most of their time with other US students despite your best efforts. Yet. And here we are in that gradual change. Here I am out on a limb. Yet I predict these students will be increasingly affected by growing social messaging in pre-collegiate education among their colleagues, among their peers, and in society in general. They will be marginalized because there is a growing feeling that this is frivolous. And this is going to be increasingly so as the financial situation of colleges and universities worsens. There's going to be demand that there's intentionality. 
with education abroad. And partying and wandering around seeking difference, not relating it to much else, it's not going to cut it. And students will begin to tell each other that. So this marginalization will occur. With the advent of new globalism, leading education abroad professionals have the opportunity to refine their role in higher education on their campuses. And here is what you can do. They need to join, you need to join with faculty and other administrators to define a 21st century education for all students. Now this can be done in several ways. And this is the concrete part of all of this rambling. Be strong advocates for better coordination between academic and non-academic life and education abroad. Introduce assessment procedures and recognition for knowledge and skills gained through non-academic activities. Such achievements should be formally recognized on the undergraduate transcript. What I am saying is take a role in the greater reform of higher education. Do not accept marginalization. You have knowledge, you have skill that is part of the larger question. And this divide we have in the US between the academic and non-academic is not sustainable. Remember, this country made a decisive decision. Our decision at the beginning, and I keep going back to the beginnings because it tells us a lot, it was that we in the US, for a lot of our education and for centuries, we would have a residentially based campus. Residentially based. Now, if residential life is simply one big expensive party, we have gone wrong. So you can be part of that, solving that for all the other administrators who are trying to figure it out. Implement pre and post testing of second language acquisition for study abroad programs and require it. Such testing will advance the impact of, of education abroad and clarify the connection to academic achievement. Work with faculty to advance interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies on campus and overseas. Again, the new globalists are receptive connections among humanities, sciences, social sciences, and the arts. Such connections are the source of solutions to shared global challenges. Work with faculty to design customized course-related education abroad that focuses on globally shared challenges. Again, your future is intentionality. But that is not an either or. Emerson said something else in the essay, Self-Reliance, or I think he did. And that is this, distinguishing characteristic of the creative person is to entertain two contradictory thoughts simultaneously. And frankly, Intentionality does not exclude what we all, I think, like, which is a looking about, a scanning of the environment. They are not either or. It can be both. And the sweet spot is what we're after, the creative part in the middle. Redefine what it means in US higher education to be a global campus. That lies before you. Establish a campus culture that encourages a wide variety of students to focus on shared global challenges. Reach the campus through the shared global challenges, not through pounding away on education abroad. You've done that. It's like pounding the liberal arts. Glaze, just a glaze. You've got to come at it a new way. Seek commonality and seeming difference. Appreciate distinctive approaches to these challenges through differing cultural backgrounds. Contribute to that broader conversation. Lead the national challenge to adopt Spanish as the United States' second language. Ensure economic and cultural competitiveness for our nation in the decades ahead and for our young people. Encourage the acquisition of additional languages in ways that our students discover personal motivation for acquiring those languages. Spearhead efforts to instill US undergraduates with the ambition to achieve a global lifestyle through education abroad and the pursuit of solutions to shared global challenges. You've got to let them see it. See what it's like when you live a life that is globally infused. My whole life after, I know Mary's here and others, but I'll tell you, my IES experience and our groups stayed close. We just had a reunion. 
how many, 40-something years later, in Freiburg. Our group got together, still. But that put me on a path of a globally infused life. And that was critical, critical. And lastly, join with other higher education leaders to identify the role of digital technologies in undergraduate education. Again, hook onto another topic. Hook on to something larger. Don't look in the navel. Don't stare at the navel. Your future is not just pounding away and redefining, well, redefining education abroad, but not redefining it and how it's been done and pounding it. Add to this the potential of an undergraduate education that involves students and faculty spending considerable time away from one physical campus. It's all part of moving in the electronic direction. Now I want to caution before I, I end here. Let's go back to the Chinese a second. A critical question to ask before concluding is whether or not the new globalism can exist without a student's assuming political and economical liberalization or democratization. That is, without being schooled in this perspective. The new globalists, after all, desire the US undergraduate experience in its totality as a platform to acquire those attributes of, we heard it, flexibility, entrepreneurialism, optimism, free association, they believe constitute a globally successful, innovative lifestyle. Their sourcing of US higher education is, however, ultimately instrumental in that they are silent about political assimilation. Yes, the new globalists display empathy for solving shared global challenges. But the degree to which politics enables instrumental change is not articulated. In fact, it is silent and avoided. But can those attributes that the new globalists wish to acquire be fully exercised without the democratic political system upon which US higher education is based and other countries? Will this dilemma ultimately confound, in particular, Chinese students, in, uh, or will they represent the new leadership that establishes economic liberalization without political liberalization. Is that possible, economic liberalization without political? Will their leadership redefine Chinese politics, or will they abandon China completely for life and work under other political systems internationally? As succinctly stated in the September 2013 report, Horizon Scanning issued by the Global Opportunities for the International Unit of the UK Higher Education and Leadership Foundation for Higher Education, liberalization as a political and economic force presents a dilemma in ethical terms. There is space there for education abroad. The need for fundamental change in education abroad in the US higher education stands before us as a challenge to build, to, to, uh, to belief in the immutability and durability of current practice. While many educators glibly take for granted the accelerating pace of change brought about by evolving digital technologies, it does not follow, as stated in the British report, Horizon Scanning, again, that the rate of change in human relations will be as fast. Technology does not have a free hand in driving change. Change is driven and held back by people, institutions, and countries with political and economic interests. What are your political and economic interests? What is holding, arguably, you back from the next generation of education abroad? Actually, doing something about change in education abroad in an expedient fashion may be the biggest challenge for you. Ironically, I would suggest that the impetus for this change will ultimately come from without. And it's not going to be of your own making. We're moving into that next stage. Things are percolating. What I've described here may not, what I said about the Chinese, may not yet be evident even to them. But that's not my job. My job in my old age is to poke, listen, bring dots together, and try to predict what's coming. Again, what I predict today may not be what I predict tomorrow. But don't worry, I'm not speaking tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>